prelim are the prelim two. We're going to hand it back today. Uh, I have them up in the box up here. What we're going to do is we're going to spread them in one of the classrooms and put them alphabetical so you guys have an easier time collecting them. The uh, mean was 77. The mean of the first prelim was 84. Um, that's usually what happens. Grades drop a little bit the minute you say chemistry, people freak out. Um, the prelim on the first one was a little higher than normal, so it's usually you know a five point drop. So it's not. I mean, this is what I expected. Um, I didn't expect to have the high and the low being so broad. The low is a 48. The high is a uh, uh, 43. The high is a 98. Um, so a couple of you guys are not going to be very happy. Um, the course eval, I shouldn't probably be saying that at the same time. My next statement is going to be the course eval. I should have done this one first. A course eval is online. Um, so you're going to have to do your login thing. You know, the normal, I'm not sure if it's, what do you got? Are you on dust? You have dust, right? Or whatever it is. Whatever the course eval is, you're going to have to, I did it online. I should have done it on paper, and I totally apologize. But if you want to evaluate the course, you're going to have to do it online. Sorry. Um, uh, the final. The final is scheduled for Wednesday, December 12th. It's going to be in this room, okay? But it's going to be at 7 p.m., okay? So it's, it's good, actually, that it's in this room because you tend to perform better in the classroom that you study in or you learn in, whatever. Um, I am going to have a makeup. Uh, it's going to be the Wednesday prior to the exam. It's going to be the first day of exam week. Okay, it is at 9 o'clock and it is going to be in Bradfield 102. I don't control this classroom. It is by acceptance though. You don't, don't just show up and expect to be able to take, you have to tell me that you're coming and I have to accept that you're coming. Okay? A number of you are already on that list. I don't know where you are. There's a couple of you that are here at the moment. Um, we're also going to have a review session and I'm hoping the review session is going to be Monday, but I I, because there's so many of you, I need to have a large classroom, and I'm going to hope for this classroom. But again, because I don't control the registrate the use of this room, I have to make sure that it's actually available. Um, so I'm planning on it being Monday. Okay. Um, any questions on that? No. All right. Jean-Marc. So what I'd like to do. This is where we ended last lecture. We're going to continue to do case study stuff. And we ended last lecture with these slides, and, and we were talking about, okay, if, if, if you're thinking about the stuff that you learned this semester, and you're trying to think about you know, sort of management, how you would manage different locations, I've got some more case studies for us to go through. And we ended at this one. Um, and this is basically erosion, but it's a number of different types of erosion that are going on here. This one is a water erosion event. Okay? This is also a water erosion event, but it's a very different type of, of, of event. Okay, and certainly very different, maybe not really different, but different management strategies to, to deal with this. This is a different type of er erosion event. This was because of a, a physical cut. This is a mechanical cut. And we talked about potential solutions to this. There's certainly engineering ones, okay? But for, and I, I didn't say this earlier, and I should have, um, for, Every one of these case studies that I'm going to show to you today, there's, there's this, have you guys heard an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? Have you ever heard that saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? For every one, uh, and literally every one of the case studies that I'm going to be showing you, yes, uh, last week, and, uh, Wednesday, and today, an ounce of prevention is definitely worth a pound of cure. Every one that you're going to see, if you had thought about what you were doing or the managers had thought about what they were doing ahead of time, they probably still would have been able to do what they wanted to do, but they wouldn't have had to deal with these types of consequences. Okay? And that's, uh, that's an important take home message. That, actually, in a sense, that's a take home message that has nothing to do with soils. It has a lot to do with soils, but it has to do with just about everything. But, all right. So uh, we talked about this one. Let's talk about these two for a second. Um, diff certainly different scales. Okay, these are both water erosion events. This one's a lot more dramatic. This is going right up against the sorghum or corn or corn. Um, any thoughts about what's going on here? What's going on? Not any thoughts. What's going on in this scenario? What? The soil is all. Yeah, I mean that's a big cut. Okay, so the problem is the problem. The result of the problem is here, but the source of this problem is not is probably not right here. 
This is the downstream effect of something that's going on upstream. Okay, so you certainly, from a solution sense, you're certainly probably going to have to think about what's going on upstream. But if you're a, a landowner or something like that, and you don't have tenure upstream, there's not a lot of, that you can do about that. You can, yeah, you can complain to your congressman or your pro, for, provincial ma governor or something like that. But in all likelihood, there's not going to be a lot of support there. Okay, so you're potentially going to have to start thinking about solutions here. And this is when we start getting, I mean, for a scenario like this, this is when we start seeing mechanical engineered solutions. Because if I can't change what's going on up, upstairs or upstream, the force of the water that's coming through this, scenario, this location has nothing to do with my land. Now, theoretically, I could, have been, I could be putting in the wrong things here. I should really be putting in willow switches or something like that to try to stabilize this bank and move my corn farther back. But the reality is this corn probably was planted a lot farther forward. And this stream at one time was way over here. And we're basically looking at entrenchment. Okay. Now, take this scenario, the homeowner, and look at a scenario like this, or the landowner. This is definitely what's going on on site. This is not a downstream, or a downstream effect from someplace else. This is something that's going on on site. Solutions here. These are not necessarily engineering solutions. What kind of solutions did you think here? What? Ground cover. Ground cover? I think I would, ground cover is a solution, but there was something I would do first before I even started thinking about ground cover. I think I would stop the traffic. OK, I think what we're seeing here is we're seeing increased traffic and then concentration. OK, so ground cover, stop the, the, the cut, the nick itself, whatever is starting the cut, and then slow the water that's moving into the system with ground cover. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, from, from, from a, a, a soil characteristic effect, what's happening here besides erosion? What does this scenario represent? If I have erosion, What's happening to my soils? What's happening to these soils right here? Let alone, and we'll, my next question is what's happening to the soils around it, too? What's happening to the soils right here? I'm losing them. Okay? I'm certainly breaking up aggregate stability, and I'm losing material. Okay? And if I'm losing this, this material, it's the surface material, which means it's the, so, the material that has the high organic matter and has the high nutrient matter. Okay, what's happening to the surrounding locations? Potentially compaction from the traffic issue. Um, what else? If this is where the water is being delivered, if the water is moving in sheet erosion, let alone rill or gully, it's bringing stuff in here, which is then lost. So I'm having erosion over here, too. Not as dramatic as here, but I'm having erosion around as well. OK, let's uh, move on to some more. This is a Swidden. I'll skip over this. this is some, these are some slides to show you some larger landscape. This is all sort of slip erosion faces in here. Um, a cut event. This could be, tim I don't know if this was timber harvest. I think this is a timber harvesting event, not a, a slash and burn. They're coming in here for timber harvesting. I'm looking at the slash that's left behind. Um, so I think they went in here, selectively cut what they want, and left everything else behind. Okay? This is the type of environment that's going to lead to some of this. Okay? So landscape losses. Um, a lot more closer to a sort of more smaller scale. Um, What's going on here? And what are they trying to do? I like this one because the, 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 the tree is actually doing something. And because it's in one location, it's only doing it there. And there's no vegetation anyplace else, really. Do you guys sort of see this? And then the gully splits. Do you guys see that? And what have they done here? 
they've bunded it up. You know, they've got a tree here, and then they're putting in coarse rock, it's sort of like a gabion basket or boulder type of approach. So they're trying to stabilize this one spot. And you can sort of see, you know, how it's, it isn't, in fact, working. But what it's doing is it's, in a sense, moving the problem. You know, this is a classic engineered solution. You put, a, you put an engineered space in one location, and the problem just moves. It do, you don't actually solve the problem in many cases. It just moves. So when you put in these engineered solutions, you, you really need to think about you know, what are the consequences. You know, I, I'm slowing the water here, and I'm con but I'm concentrating the flow someplace else. Right? OK, from a soil's perspective, any thoughts here? This is a lot like this one. It's a lot like this one. Any thoughts here? Any solutions? Stop it at the source system. Stop it at the source. Again, you might potentially have tenure issues there. But that's one of the things that people are thinking about. And let me take a, um, I'm going to skip ahead for a second. And I want you guys to see this sequence right here. OK, so here's, this is, this is an in progress. I don't have a picture of this prior to the problem. OK, but you can sort of see the problem here. But you notice what they're putting. This is the, you can see a very large sort of gully in there. Do you guys see stuff inside the gully? It looks like there's a series of walls. We call these check dams. This is an, en and this is an engineered solution. OK, what they've done is they put in a series of check dams. If they put a check dam in, it basically, um, acts as a dam for a very small section of the stream or the gully. Now, what is that going to do? Well, the water is going to go in. I'm not stopping the flow of water. But what I'm doing is I'm slowing the flow of water, and I'm trapping sediment. Okay, so if I trap that sediment, these dams, okay, if I got a big gully, okay, way down here, and the dam is up here, this is like all dams. The sediment's going to get trapped behind that dam. The water's going to go over it, but the sediment's going to get trapped. Okay? The dam slows the water down. The energy of the water column is reduced. Things come out of suspension. They get trapped. Okay? Now, in combination with the tr sediment trapping and the water slowing down with these check dams, you also put vegetation in. You plant vegetation. Okay? Because these dams, as with all dams, these dams are sooner or later going to fail which means all the sediment and everything else, the water flow is going to start moving again fast, and the sediment's going to be moving. But if I put something in there to help glue it in place for a longer period of time, I get something like this. Willow planting, silex, I don't know. OK. Um, so, what, so this is a combination of an engineered solution as, long, as well as a biological solution. OK. Now. Soils, what's going on here? Let's start in this scenario. What are you going to start seeing soils-wise when you start putting these check dams in? How about I ask this question? The sediment that's going to be collected in here, what's the texture probably going to be? It's going to be more in the silty, the finer end. OK, does that make sense? Now, the higher energy scenarios, you, some of that silt stuff and clay are going to be gone. So initial capture is going to be the coarser material. And then as the water slows down more and more and more, you're going to start collecting the silts and sands. So you're going to, oh, in a sense, have a stratification up of finer textures. Okay, so from a management sense, what does that tell you? I mean, if I want to plant these guys down the road, I know there is stratigraphy in my soil, my traps. What should I be thinking? I have gravel subsoils, fine textured surfaces. What does that tell you? High water retention. High water retention up top, down below, probably not that great. But a lot of good subsurface flow. OK. Finer textures up top. Higher CECs, probably more nutrients up top. And certainly when the plants start mining down below and depositing, as well as all the stuff that's going to be coming off these uplands, I'm going to have nice, rich, very fertile soils. And because of the hydrology of the system, probably a good amount of water. Okay? 
And I'm probably, now granted I have check dams, but those check dams are going to create a high water table. Think about this. Okay, what do these check dams do? They stop the water, right? If they stop the water, the water has to build up to go over the dam, right? If I have soil inside that volume, what's the water table going to be doing? Rising to go over. Now, this is a strategy that's actually used in a good chunk of the world when you get down to the Middle East. And you actually see this in, sometimes in California, where they actually have subsurface dams. The dams don't come up to the surface. What they do is they dig a hole, they put a dam in, but the dam doesn't go all the way to the surface. Okay? They then fill it in. Okay? They basically find an old riverbed or an active riverbed that's a basically what we would consider dry. Okay, a dry riverbed isn't really dry, it's just the water is flowing deep. Put a dam in, back up the water, make the water come closer to the surface, and you now can plant in there and the roots can get down to the water table. In essence, an application of the same strategy, except in that scenario we're basically putting in droughty areas, desert areas, where we can use these abandoned or Wadi type of stream systems where the water is below ground. Cool beans? Go. So, in like wetter climates, like in this riverbed kind of issues, would you end up having like anoxic problems with planting? It depends on how these, the, the, how this takes care of that, uh, how, how it fills up that material. One of the reasons why I tend to think that this is willow material is because these systems are going to be wet. These are not going to be nicely drained soils. And so I have to think about the vegetation that's moving in here. And so I'm in all likelihood, that's why I'm, you know, all likelihood this is a willow or willow-esque type of plant. Okay, questions on this one? Any thoughts? No? All right, let me take some steps back. Okay, when we talk about erosion, most people would think about erosion, we think about sort of this type of erosion. Um, but what I'd like to do is also talk about some other types of erosion. We have this end of the erosion where we're seeing the cut, you know, where this, this material is being pulled away. But we also have erosion events where we look at the other end of the spectrum, where we're looking at the sediment being deposited. Okay. Now, when we have flood events and things like that, people, you know, we have water coming in and you're sort of like, oh, it's taking everything away. But it's also a case where the water is bringing stuff in. Okay. Uh, some very good scenarios right here in New York State was when the Susquehanna was moving through uh, or flooding not that long ago. Uh, we had farms that were basically, basically taken away and then we had farms that were basically buried. Okay. You got to think about this end of the spectrum as well. Now, from a management sense, the Mississippi does this all the time as well. You know, when a dike breaks on a farmland area, the farms are usually ruined for a period of time. But it's not because the soil of their farm is taken away. It's because their rich, lust soils are basically buried underneath sand. Does that make sense? OK, so from a management sense, what are some of the strategies here? Think about it from a soil's perspective. How would you think about remediating or mitigating bringing this soil back into production without having to take a backhoe to it? Thoughts? Deep-rooted Deep material. First thing to stabilize it, because this stuff is going to be moving all over the place. But if it's sand, it's probably not going to have a lot of water holding capacity. So get those roots down to the old soil, in essence. Is that your th thought? So get the roots, pl put plants in that are deep rooting, that are, you'd also have to think about what type of plant, not just deep rooting, but also they'd have to be drought resistant to get to that. You know, if I put little seedlings in there sitting in sand, they're not going to make it. So I'm going to have to think about how I'm planting. Any other strategies? Go. You put end fixing plants in there. Um, Around here, this, I mean, you're going to have temporary drought type of conditions. You're probably not going to be that big of a deal. But last summer was a drought year for us. So 
again, you're going to have to think about how those plants are going to get, going to get established. Any other strategies? So far, we got the plant strategies. Any other strategies? If I was going to put an amendment or something like that in there. Organic Adding organic matter would go a long way to sort of uh, increasing water holding capacity. I don't, you don't, you're not going to have an issue with infiltration here. So organic matter is not going to do a lot for infiltration for you. But it certainly will do a lot for water storage. And it will also do a lot for nutrient holding capacity. Yeah, you're also going to get, or, you're, I mean, you're going to get fertilizer from the, but it's more about the ability to hold on to those nutrients as well. Any other thoughts here? No? All right. This photo is not upside down. Any thoughts as to what we're seeing here? This is very large, so this is regional. I'm going to sort of give you an idea. That's a building over there, a little scale, sick ailer. It's a rather large building. What? It's, uh, well, theoretically, it could have been. But right now, you see all these sort of waves that you're seeing in here? And it's not water. It's not mud. This is wind. OK, these are dunes. Uh, somehow, my sequence is out of order. We're supposed to be looking at this kind of landscape. Sorry, we'll go back to that one. Drier environments, OK? So this is water erosion on top of a drier environment, very flat landscape moving through. Where you see these sort of hummocks is where the grass has basically been established. And the grass is literally, or the plants are literally holding the soil in place and everything else is being moved away. Do you guys remember when we, talk, we were talking about real erosion? I had this, very, uh, this one slide that had uh, sort of like uh, pediments or pillars, small scale. The pencil was like this big and the pillars were like this big. Okay. And what was sitting on top of the pillars? Little pebbles, right? Okay. Well, the same thing is sort of happening here. In this case, the roots of the plants are basically stabilizing the, pl the soil around it, and everything else is just sort of being eroded away. Okay. Um, you know, so here's some encroachment. This is agricultural land sitting over here. Okay. But you can see this. It's just when I say agriculture, it's sort of grazing land. Okay. You can see the encroachment coming in. Now here's the picture of that sort of the grazing land. Very sparse now. Part of what's going on here potentially is overgrazing on this side, and we're seeing desertification type of offense. But in this scenario, we're actually looking at uh, what the heck? The whole thing. Oh, right here. In this case, what we're looking at is we're looking at sort of desertification, the, the desert encroaching in on the agricultural land. Okay? This is actually the Midwest. Okay, this is the Texas Panhandle, so this is not necessarily Northern Africa. This happens all over the world. Okay, um, some more slides of this. You can see this was agricultural land. This is probably cotton land. Okay, and you can actually still see where the rows were. This is North Africa, but you're basically looking at the that when I mean, the wind picks up, where's this stuff going? Okay, this is sort of the lust type of event we had periglacially, except this is climate. This is climate, climate and humans. Okay, here's a little bit more dramatic, where you're looking at the dunes coming in. This is this is the dust. This is the dunes. We got one really dramatic slide. This one. This is actually this is beautiful. I mean, that's a pretty picture. Unless you're the person that lives here. You know, so you know this is this is what's happening in the world. Now, some of this is natural, and some of this is us moving into places we probably shouldn't be, but some of this is us doing stuff and the world coming to us. OK, so from this is a far, this is, I'm, I, I'm not even going to go back to the slide. This is a far removed from that water deposited sand sitting, you know, six or eight inches thick. We're looking at meters of stuff. I mean, these are trees here. I think this is Morocco. I'm not sure, though. Yeah, this, the southern end versus the northern end of the desert. Um, OK, so strategies. Let's go back to the planting one. Right there. What are they doing? 
Now this is not going to stop that. <laughs> but this might. This is basically that. What you're looking at here is webbing of plants. Okay, and there's like a jute webbing, and then there's seeds, and they basically grass out of it. It's meant to stabilize the movement of the dune. Okay, here's another example. In this case, you're looking at cactuses series. This is sort of like terracing. They're basically taking the terrace of the of the dune, and they're basically putting these things in. Okay, and this is also they're putting this in for agricultural purposes. They'll they'll use these to harvest. Scenario, sort of this is a sequence of events. This is what the landscape looked like. This is what they then did, where they basically planted, dug a lot of holes, and planted fairly regularly plants. Dun, 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 today. Starting from that, ending with that. So what happened? Yes, a lot of dedicated people step, stood, up, stood up, stepped up, and did the right thing. But what did they do? How did they get it to that? What, if they plant, what, what's, what's going on? What? OK. So the, that's the plants, they put these plants in place. The plants are doing two things. One is they're stabilizing stuff. Okay? In fact, the plants are acting, in a sense, acting very much like those check dams. They're stabilizing the soil at that location. And with windbreaks, they're reducing, because they're creating a reference, a reference on that soil surface, they're reducing the amount of wind. So not only are they stabilizing the soil that they are sitting in, they're also reducing the amount of wind, which makes, means they're capturing a larger space. Much like those check dams are reducing the speed of the water, so the carrying, so the entrainment of material in that water, the stuff that's being entrained starts falling out. Well, the same thing's going to happen here. Okay? And as these trees get bigger and bigger and bigger, they're going to be more and more and more effective. Okay? What else are they doing? Yeah, they could theoretically be doing that. They could be mining water and bringing the water back up to the surface. Uh, and there's a lot of trees that do that. And there's a lot of research that's on people that are looking at that. Okay, so I've got stabilization and I potentially have uh, water mining. What else is going on? Organic matter contributions. Right now, I mean, if you look at this slide right here, this is not one species of organism or plant that's in here. Yet they only planted one. They planted that, you know, this. This is what they planted. Yet they're getting, at the end of the scenario, they're getting this. So these plants start stabilizing stuff. They start adding organic matter. Okay, they're stabilizing the wind. They're getting more soils that are being captured in this place. With those winds are also coming seeds. You know, theoretically, they could have seeded as well. Okay, but now that I've captured other stuff in here, I now stabilize my environment. And from a soil's perspective, I'm based, what am I doing? I'm stabilizing, I'm adding organic matter, potentially mining water. I'm creating an environment that can support this. Now, the reality is they could be cutting this, they can be cu cutting this for grazing or for firewood or something like that. Okay, yet they still get the benefits of the landscape. You're not getting a lot from that. Okay, questions? Any other thoughts? Go. Uh, I don't know. Acacia type of, I'm not, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, the question was what kind of tree? Does anybody know off the top? You know, there's not a lot of grape. I don't know. Sorry. All right, some, let's skip over, go this way. Um, some, all right, next one. Classic Soviet Union picture. I mean, this is probably a, a, a postcard, okay? 
Yeah, you know, the big babush just driving the thing down the road. Okay, um, what's going on here besides propaganda? What are they, what's going to be happening to the soils? Compaction. What else? Those plows going through all the time. What? Potentially we're going to get a hard pan underneath as well. So a compaction at the top as well as a hard pan or a plow pan farther down. Okay, if those plows are going through all the time, Andrew, what? Um, they're probably losing all the structure. Destroying all the structure. Okay, so compaction, destruction, well, I guess in compaction in the sense you're making structure, but you're losing all those granular structure. Okay, what else is happening if I'm plowing all the time? Increased decomposition rate, so I'm going to be losing my organic matter. Okay, if I start losing my organic matter and I got stressed soils, potentially I'm going to have wind erosion and potentially I'm going to be losing nutrients. Okay, any other thoughts as to about what's going on here? Let's some more slides. Okay, this is compaction in a plow layer. So here's the soil surface they've dug down. Can you see this band right here? Yeah, that's the plow pan. I've got another shot of it right here. Okay, so this is corn. What they did was they did some deep tillage this way, but you can see a series of sort of one, two, three compacted lenses there. Okay, part of that's, tr most of that's traffic. And you can see it's sort of where the tra traffic is right here, right here, right here. That's from the tires, this and this. This could be traffic across the top, but it also could be the plow itself the disc line or the, uh, the chisel line, okay? So what have they done here? They basically have done some deep tillage, breaking through those and planting inside them, okay? In the long term, you let the, let the soil re fix itself, reduce the amount of traffic, and this will not necessarily go away very fast, but you'll be able to use the soil, okay? Other strategies, this was a timber area, okay? You can see where the old material is being used. They basically compacted it for equipment usage. The solution in this case, material placed prior to compaction. So this is the material that basically got that. So it just gives you an idea about how, how compacted these soils can theoretically get. Um, it's not, this is not just a scenario that we see in forested and agricultural land. This is also a, a feature that we see with development in, 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 in sort of in urban environments as well as suburban environments. Okay, this is a subdivision. They're growing uh, houses. What do you see going on here? compaction, equipment usage, something that you don't see, in fact, has already been harvested and taken away. A lot of these subdivisions, what they'll do when the contractors, they own the land, what they'll do is they'll come in and they'll scalp the surface. So they'll take the A horizon, sometimes the, some parts of the B and the E, and they'll take it away. And then they'll sell it as topsoil. Okay, and then they'll go in there and they'll build these buildings, compacting the soil with subsoil as at the surface, and then they'll sell it to people, saying, here, here's your new home. Okay, they walk away, they are not giving you back topsoil, but they're more than willing to sell it back to you. Okay, now, if you've compacted your surfaces and then you go back in there and put topsoil on top of it, you think you might be doing the right thing. And in, in a sense, you are in the right direction. You're moving in the right direction. But if this subsoil has been compacted from all the equipment and I put a cap on top of it, what's going to happen? Water's going to go straight through, and it's going to hit that compacted stuff, and what's it going to do? If you're on a slope, it might do like it did with the Mount, uh, with the Mount Pleasant, with the Martins. But if you're not, that water's just going to come right back up. Right? It's just, you're not come right back up. The water table is just going to rise. And what is that going to be doing to all those thousands of dollars of landscape material that you put in? <laughs> Basically drowning them. Okay, so from a management sense, what would you be doing instead? If this is, if this is what my site was, 
before they released it to me. Yeah, they're going to hydro seed and all that stuff, you know, make it look pretty. But what are you going to do to bring that landscape in, back into a productive quality soil? Production for what you want it to be. Maybe you'd like mud. I don't know. Worms. Worms. That's actually a good idea. Anything that would start penetrating that compaction. Now, worms are going to have a hard time doing that all on their own. This is one of those scenarios where you might, in fact, want to go in there with deep tillage, break it up, and then bring in your topsoil. Introduce your worms. You need to somehow break this liner. Okay, now, time will break it for you. But if you, I mean, you sit there a couple of years, it, it will, it will, sooner or later the cracks will form and things will get through there. But if you want to accelerate that, basically accelerating natural processes, what would you do? Well, I'd break it up a little bit, just like natural processes would break it up through freezing and thawing, movement, all different kinds of stuff. Expansion, contraction with moisture. Make sense? Right? Yeah? Okay. Um, let's move into some more urban stuff. This is a little bit more of what I do. Um, just to sort of give you a, a landscape, um, sort of the, um, the, the neighborhoods. Okay. Um, often when you start talking about urban environments and you talk about soils, people look at you like, there's no soils in urban environments. Um, it turns out that there's a lot of soil in urban environments. Even though this is tarmac, there's lots of soil underneath this. Um, and often another uh, th uh, sort of misnomer that people think about urban environments is that because we've sealed off all the surfaces, soils below the surfaces are very dry. It turns out that that's not actually the case. In fact, most soils underneath the surfaces are really, really wet because you have to think about what else is underneath that surface. The surface basically reduces evapotranspiration. It doesn't, and it also to a certain extent, it reduces infiltration, but there are still cracks. But more importantly, think about all the infrastructure that is underneath our roads. There's water underneath our roads. Domestic water supplies, water coming to our houses, but also sewer, water leaving our houses. And all of those, that infrastructure is broken. Now, I don't mean it in the sense that it's broken, it's not working at all, but there are cracks in that infrastructure. I think New York City is a really good example of this. New York City's got a great water system, but I think like 10 to 20 percent of the water that leaves the reservoirs doesn't actually come outside the tap. It basically comes out through leaks in the infrastructure. Okay. Now, if I have that leak going into the in, coming out of the infrastructure that's sitting underneath this tarmac, and I've reduced evapotranspiration, what do you think the moisture levels are underneath these soils? Probably pretty high. OK, now, if they are pretty high, there's a likelihood that there is going to be a lot of anaerobic conditions underneath there. And what happens when we have anaerobic conditions? We start seeing different types of nitrogen. I mean, diff lots of degassing of material, okay? non-anaerobic respiration. Now, do you guys remember us talking about nit the nitrogen cycle and me looking at, uh, we have, I had a slide up that had a natural system and an uh, uh, urban system, and we're looking at nitrogen num numbers and denitrification rates. And the urban slide had, the urban side of the, the water, the, the slough or the creek, the urban side had huge numbers of denitrification. Why? The systems are anaerobic. Anaerobic systems encourages denitrification, right? All right, so let's keep looking at some of this landscape. Uh, from a soil's perspective, doesn't look like a lot of soil here, OK? But I mean, this is Baltimore. I think this is Baltimore. A lot of these sites have enough soil and enough environment that they are. I mean, there's poppies there. OK. Now, sort of reiterate the fact that there are, in fact, soils there. These are two of the soils that are from New York City. This is Fresh Kills here on the left and, and Central Park. These are the names. These are the soil series names, OK, like Marden. OK, this is Fresh Kills and this is Central Park. 
not your general idea of what you see as a soil. Okay? This literally, you know, it's French kills. I talked about French kills last lecture. Okay? It's a dump. It's a landfill. Okay? And what you're looking at here is basically landfill material with a cap on top. It is a soil. It's behaving. It's performing. It's got all the characteristics of what a soil is. It is a soil. It may not be the natural material that we're used to, but a lot of this stuff is just organic material. Okay. How about this one over here, Central Park? All different kinds of debris. Does anybody know when, when, when they made Central Park? Does anybody know anything about Central Park? Central Park is a big park that's sitting in the middle of Manhattan. Okay. It was made. Okay. And how they made it was they literally brought material in and reworked the space. There were buildings and farms and stuff in this location. Okay. Olmsted came in, cleaned it out, and built it. Okay. And how did they build it? Wagon loads. And I li literally, horse and buggy wagon loads, not dump trucks and things like that. Wagon loads of material that they brought it in. Okay. Now, in, this, in a sense, this is like an erosion event or a flood event, except this is a man-made event. Filled material, it's made of fill material. Some other examples, this is LaGuardia. Okay, you can see cement, you can see boulders, you can see pipes, all different kinds of material. A different type of debris material, fill material. Okay, over here, this is an inwood. Okay, this literally is cement cubes. They've taken debris and they've put it in place. Now, this is, a, this is the history of an urban environment. This is, happens to be the history of New York. Inwood is northern Manhattan, the western uh, part of northern Manhattan, right up by the Spite and Diable, but it's on sort of the Hudson River side, overlooking the Hudson River. Okay? Um, to the north of it is the Bronx. To the west of it is literally East River. Uh, to the east of it is literally East River. Okay, building debris. Okay, so you've seen these four different built, four different soils. Management. What kind of management concerns do you have here? What kind of things are you going to be thinking about? We can start with this one. This will be an easy one to start with. Soil properties there. What are they? They drain really, well. they drain really, really well. So these are very droughty soils. They don't flood a lot though. Okay, so. If it's also made out of cement, tell me something about the pH. Pretty high. Okay, calcium carbonate. Cement is calcium carbonate. Okay, or a big chunk of it is. If I've got calcium carbonate, I've got fairly high pHs. Okay, I've got good drainage, very poor water holding capacity, high pHs. Does it sound like any place you know? Maybe the southwest. This is, all, this is almost like an aridosol, except with really big chunks. OK? The droughty conditions, high pHs. Management strategy right there, start thinking about what type of things that you potentially could be putting in this location. OK? If it was about vegetation. What other strategies might you have here? If you wanted to put a farm in here, you'd have some serious issues. Okay. On the other hand, if you wanted to put a parking lot in here, this is awesome. I mean, I don't have to worry about flooding on my parking lot ever. Make sense? And in all likelihood, because of the way these things are dropped in, I don't have to worry about subsidence either. Okay, let's back. Let me go farther forward. This is a bulkhead soil. Uh, this spot right down here is literally asphalt. Okay, and it's just mulch material basically on top of that. Management, any thoughts there? Are you liking this? I mean, come on. It's, it's, these are scenarios that are definitely outside of your, per, this is outside of your experience. And that was what we're trying for. So think outside the box. Or how about using the box that we taught you this semester? Issues. Water. I got a lot of organic material here, and this is New York City, so I probably have got a good amount of aerial deposition. But 
water, there's certainly going to be short periods of time that this is droughty. Or flooding. Or flooding. And if I get flooding, my, my soil is literally going to float away because this is wood chips. Any other thoughts here? Deep-rooted plants are going to be problematic. Trees and things like that are not going to be. In fact, they use most. This is for mostly for vegetables and berry berry production. Okay. Now, with asphalt down here, you probably have some PAHs or hydrocarbons coming up from the. I mean, asphalt is basically oil. You know, it's an oil product. Okay. So you probably have some issues with the asphalt. Okay. So let's go back to some of these guys. How about with fresh kills? Let's talk about fresh kills. Management issues here. Contaminants. Contaminants. I mean, that's a lot of what I do. Contaminants. All right. How are we going to deal with contaminants? Find out what they are and what, what happens? I mean, there's contaminants everywhere. We're going to run out of money. I think that's right. We should, if, you should find out what the contaminants are, but there's a lot of ways of figuring out what the contaminants are. You can look at the history of the site. In this case, I'd say you have everything. You got it. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. OK. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, do you, can we use this for agriculture? Phytoremediation potential. But phytoremediation is only going to work for organics. It's not going to work for heavy metals. And phytoremediation is not necessarily a way of getting rid of something. It might also be a way of just sort of stabilizing it. But phytoremediation is something you should be thinking at here. Uh, uh, that was you saying, all three of you said the same thing? Potentially fruit trees uh, or trees of some sort. You may not want to use it for fruit production. It certainly, actually, it turns out that you probably could do fruit production here, but I'd hate to have to sell those to anybody. Saying, you know, I'm the Fresh Kills Orchard. <laughs> it, that would be a tough. That would be a tough sell. Um, not, not, not that that's not necessarily. An, an, or I, mean, I, I probably wouldn't be doing fruit trees. I think I'd probably be doing raised beds and vegetables that have shallower roots, so my roots don't actually get into this. Because um, we don't. I mean, there's not a lot of research that's saying that fruit trees, uh, the apples aren't going to suddenly become, you know, the, the wicked witch's apple. You know, um, but, but I would hate to be the person trying to sell my produce coming from the landfill. Okay, but what other things potentially here? Yeah, what you can do is that, that's actually there's a, a guy Stephen Hendel and he's in Rutgers. He's been doing some re or for a long time. I'm not sure if he's still doing that. He's been doing some research on some of these abandoned landfills, and it turns out that these abandoned landfills are awesome refugia for biological diversity, because humans don't go there. We see plant species and insect species that you don't see anywhere else sitting in these landfills. And obviously, there's diversity here because you've got all this kind of diversity. But that biodiversity, putting in stabilizing with a robust community, might actually be a good strategy. And then it's just sort of saying, OK, we're going to turn this into a nature preserve, in essence. OK, because you really don't want kids playing on this. you know. You theoretically could put a parking lot on top of it and put structures up and vent it and things like that. But there's going to be venting coming off of this. Go. The biodiversity, do you know how much of it is native versus exotic? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think a lot of it was pretty it was native. Because I think when I was, this was like a decade ago, when I was, or maybe longer than that, when I was reading this, um, it really, a lot of the, the a lot of the meat of, the, of his research was look at all the native population that we're, we're basically creating this refugia for. Okay. okay. I have lots more case studies, but I'm going to run out of time. Um, last lecture, guys. I want to thank you guys. I hope when you leave here, they have a better appreciation for soils. Uh, if you have any kind of questions, come and talk to me.